One of the things that was that's really interesting to me uh, that I didn't really anticipate, like taking a new job uh, a couple years ago, was um, how a different um, uh, infrastructure could actually change how I write code, uh, and the, the availability availability of different tools um, really impacts like the uh, the way I ship code and uh, kind of. The, the confidence level I have in it. Uh, so one of those um, tools that, that really impacted me was Zookeeper, um, which is a, um, it's a highly consistent distributed key value store. Um, there's a couple like them, um, like etcd or console or something. Um, so this talk isn't necessarily specific to Zookeeper, but it's what we have and it's what we run, uh, and it's pretty amazing. Um, and so the uh, kind of the little background about what Zookeeper is, or none of this is even going to make sense. Um, so it's a key value store, and I said it's highly consistent, and that means, so it's, it's um, distributed, so you have a couple nodes, depending on, you know, what kind of failure rate you want to, or fa failure characteristics you want to achieve. Um, so, you know, three or five or something is common. Um, and so writes have to be accepted by a majority for them to return. So writes are inherently expensive because you have to have a bunch of machines coordinating that value. Um, but reads are, are cheap because any node can reply to any request and just give you the value. Uh, so it's for a, the kind of load where you just have, you know, it's high reads, low writes, it's great for that. Um, and the, uh, so the keys in them are hierarchical. Uh, they're shown like they're slash separated, kind of like a Unix file system path. Um, and any key can contain data and also children. So kind of like if you take files and directories in Unix and smash them together, that's kind of what this is. Um, and then kind of uh, there's two key features uh, that we use a lot um, that are kind of unique to this kind of system. Uh, one of them is a watcher. So any client can register an interest in a specific key. And when it's updated, it'll get a notification. And then it can, um, so the one time, once and done kind of notification. So once it sends it, then it deregisters you. So you at most get one notification for, uh, for a change. Um, and then another one is ephemeral nodes. So when uh, you can, as a client, register this node and mark it as ephemeral, and then when you disconnect or if, you're, if the process dies or whatever, your connection to Zookeeper goes away, then Zookeeper will delete that for you. Uh, and um, they're used in conjunction a lot, so you have one process that starts up and creates this ephemeral node and other clients watching that, and when it goes away, it knows that that original process died or is finished or whatever, depending on you know, what the application is doing. Um, so I've got a couple examples. Um, the first one is, um, so the, the first um, common sort of use case or example code you'll see is creating like a lock, distributed lock service. Um, so you have like a, um, uh, a resource, uh, like for in our case, we have this uh, scheduling service, which is kind of like um, cron, basically. And so we want one of those to be running at any given time. We don't, you know, if you have two or more running, that would kind of be bad. Um, so, uh, and then if one fails, we want another one to pick it up. So we have it running on a bunch of different machines at any given time. They all start up, you know, when we ship out code, they all start up, try to acquire a lock. One of them's gonna get it, the other <coughs> remaining are gonna be denied, and then they, all those that are denied, register a watcher on the lock, and then when it goes away, then the next one picks it up and keeps going. Um, so this is kind of just a super, like, naive example of what that might look like. Um, so you have, um, if you're not familiar with Ruby, the dollar sign prefix variables are just globals. That's kind of a, I mean, really simple way to throw together an example. Um, so you create a new Zookeeper instance, um, or a connection to a Zookeeper that's already running. Uh, and then this, the ZK gem is a wrapper around the Zookeeper um, client library, and it just adds some um, kind of extra functionality on top of it, like locks um, and uh, semaphores and a bunch of different like primitives that you can use to build on top so you're not like reinventing the wheel all the time. Um, so in this example, super simple, like it starts up, uh, tries to acquire a lock with uh, this with lock method. And the semantics of this are if it gets the lock, the block is executed right away. And if it doesn't get it, it's just going to sit there and wait until it gets it. 
um, which is perfect for, you know, it's exactly what the, uh, the distributed like scheduler we want. It just all start up and just sit there and wait for a lock acquisition. And if you get it, just do some work. Um, and so, uh, I mean, actually running the examples is really not all that interesting um, because, you know, it does exactly what I said. Um, so, you know, you have this bottom process here, and if you kill it, um, then another one picks up and takes over. Um, and so the one thing to note about locks and Zookeeper, um, which it's pretty obvious, like, once you think about it a little bit or run into problems with it, but um, that the locks are um, advisory locks. Like, Zookeeper has no control over what your code actually does. So the resource being locked and the clients uh, trying to acquire the locks, they could do whatever they want. Um, and so uh, kind of in our case, um, you have this scheduler running. Um, and uh, I guess I should probably start this problem so it's running. Um, if it hangs, so I, I just suspended the process to kind of simulate like what would happen if it would just uh, whatever a long garbage collection falls or something. Either its connection to Zookeeper was lost, uh, and so Zookeeper obviously you know it recognized that it died. I turned down the heartbeat like way down, so you wouldn't have to sit here for like a minute waiting for that. Um, and then so another one picked it up, um, but this first process. Um, doesn't actually validate the lock is still valid. So when it comes back on, it's just going to keep going. Um, and so that's where uh, that's where the the whole advisory lock part comes in. Like when you're actually doing the work or doing something with the lock, you should check with Zookeeper and actually make sure that this lock is still valid because it could have gone away. You know, Zookeeper could have went down, or your connection with it could have went down in the time between you acquiring it and doing some work. Uh, and so that obviously, in order to validate a lock, requires an extra round trip to the database, um, which, depending on what you're doing, may not be uh, reasonable. You know, if you're doing if something that's, you know, you're doing thousands of requests per second, like an extra database round trip is pretty bad. So, depending on what you what your application is, you know, you have to keep that in mind. Um, so this simple, you know, this assert just takes the lock that it has. Ping Zookeeper checks to see if it's still valid, um, and uh, and if it's invalid, it'll raise that exception, saying that, um, and then we can, you know, the semantics of Ruby that retry just goes back up to the top of the begin and tries again, um, and so this looks a little better. Um, let's. Uh, And so now we have the same uh, as before. If we suspend this one, we have another one pick up. Uh, and then when this bottom one starts up again, uh, it's going to uh, realize it doesn't have the lock anymore because it tries to validate it. And it obviously does not have it, so it doesn't execute anymore. Um, but wasn't the, sorry to interrupt, but didn't your recovery thing say that it's supposed to print to the console? It does. I'm actually not sure why it didn't print it. I tried this a thousand times, and I swear to you it printed. Okay. Uh, you know what? Let's try this one again. Yeah, you know what? It's, it's got to be something with this display. It's just not, you just can't that's, see it. <laughs> it's printing locally. If you could see it on my screen, you, you would see it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I, sorry, I, yeah, you know, computers. <laughs> He's doing the presentation, right? <laughs> right. For security reasons. <laughs> Can't take your word for it. You don't know, trust me. <laughs> um, and so another, uh, so locks are very common. Like if you're looking up Zookeeper and what people do with it, distributed locks are pretty like one of the top of the list. Um, uh, another big uh, feature using the watchers that we use is kind of for configuration, like application level. Um, like bits of algorithms, like you're writing this code and you're you know processing batches of messages and you have to set like the batch size and you're not sure what it should be, so you kind of just guess and put it in there. Um, one thing that's that um, so it, in a previous uh, I previously I've done a lot of Heroku stuff and I was really accustomed to like throwing that in like in an environment variable um, and then 
uh, but changing an environment variable requires, you know, it restarts your application, uh, which, you know, if it takes a minute to start up, that kind of sucks. Uh, especially if, you know, there are web servers, then your entire site is inaccessible for a minute while you restart. And, you know, there's obviously, there's other ways to achieve this uh, without Zookeeper, but that was my previous life. And so coming here, uh, we use um, this, this, um, Oh, that's right. We have this uh, kind of data structure, I guess you could call it, uh, called a distributed hash table that's backed by a zookeeper. Uh, so you give it a connection and a key, and um, then it, it gives you, it's basically just a wrapper around a normal Ruby hash. So it takes that Ruby hash and serializes it and sticks it in zookeeper. And when it changes, it gets notified and gets the value and updates that hash behind the scenes. So there's just a background thread running um, to get those updates. Uh, and so the, the great thing about this is you can throw this into like the critical path of your application because it's just to actually like do reads. Since it's just reading from a hash, you're not doing round trips to the database to get this data. Um, it really it kind of uh, uh, changed the way I thought about you know, how configuration, like how easily you can configure something. Like you could be like, have your system like in the middle of this loop churning through data and be tweaking these values on the fly. Uh, and, and then behind the scenes, it's, you know, updating its behavior in real time. You're not restarting things. You're not, you know, having to like redeploy stuff. Um, and that, that for me was, you know, a, a great, it, it really removed a lot of stress, especially when like, you have to pick these numbers. You don't know what the heck, you know, what, depending on the load, you know, maybe it works now and it's great, but then when you're under high load or when a database falls over, like, then you're doing way too much work and you want to, like, scale that back. Uh, this kind of gives you sort of a quick escape hatch. Um, and so, like, the first use case for Zookeeper that we had was uh, we wanted to display, like, a status message at the top of the site. So when you're using the site, you know, if, if there's some sort of outage or slow down where, uh, so I work at a company called Paper Trail and we do a lot of logs. Uh, so you send your logs to us and we'll store them for you and uh, show them, um, you know, you can pull up the site and see your logs, search them, all that stuff. So there's tons of failure modes where the website is accessible and you could like, you could see logs, but maybe they're delayed coming in. And so, you know, would, you would be really confused. You're looking here, you're seeing your systems running, but you're not seeing any log output. Um, and so, uh, you know, one of the things, just a little banner at the top saying, hey, there's a message, here's, here's a link that you can, you know, see the status page and get more information or something like that. Um, and so that was just a really simple, like, um, uh, we just want this hash to have a message in a color and throw that in Zookeeper and then have all of the web servers, uh, you know, in the page render, it checks to see if, if that is null or nil. And if it, you know, if it is, it just keeps going. It doesn't do anything. And then when like from the admin console or from the Rails console, you uh, update that in Zookeeper, you set a status message, then uh, the next time a page is loaded, it, you know, it sees that value and I didn't have to do any, like, we're not adding an extra database lookup in our page render cycle, because, you know, that would, that would be unfortunate. Um, and so I have an example of that, which is, um, you know, it, the, the, <laughs> The unfortunate part of this uh, kind of presentation is the code is just not that interesting because, uh, you know, this is just kind of me demonstrating how we use it. But I mean, it really is just like conceptually like thinking about um, writing this writing code or having a problem where I want to inject or, or change the behavior of the system and not really having those tools available to me. Um, and so this is, uh, so I kind of, uh, I was having a little too much fun with with these scripts and I wanted to like mimic the behavior of clients like uh, of the, like the request cycle without having to, to like do rails. Sorry, court. Um, and uh, so I have this, you know, little function that uh, that just prints that notice. Uh, and then I have this kind of, kind of grosser code down here that actually captures the signal and, and you don't have to understand this code. It's, that's what I put at the bottom. Uh, so all you need to know is when I hit control C, it just <laughs> the notice again. Um, and uh, so, oh, this is doing a lot of work. Um, so examples. Uh, system notice. Uh, 
And so control C and it obviously shows you nothing. Um, so if I load up this RB console, and now I can get a um, system notice. Ooh. Yeah, so you can see the system notice is new. And so, um, oops. yes. And so then there's this update method that if you call it, it sets the hash, and that set actually you know goes through to Zookeeper and does your does the update. So if I you know, update with um, high and green or something, then Control C like that it gets the message. It's um, it's amazing when computers work. Um, uh, and then, uh, I, so then that was just kind of a you know simple example for you know pulling configuration in, in your code um, backed by Zookeeper. Um, another thing we've done so many times is uh, like rewriting a feature or either adding a new feature or changing the behavior of, of the existing of an existing feature. Uh, you know, if it's you want to squeeze more performance out of it, or uh, maybe reduce the load. And so we have some ideas of how to achieve that. Um, but um, you know, the stuff that's running on production now is known. At least that's a, a known quantity. You know, adding something new is always, at least for me, worrisome, especially when it's like a valuable sort of feature. Um, so feature flags have, have really changed kind of my life here. Um, I mean, pretty much everything we do that's that's of substance is backed by a feature flag, um, and so I'm not even going to really bother running these because they, they were not they're not flashy demos. But um, so I mean, really, the only thing I, I changed here was you know we extracted some uh, extracted the original behavior into two methods, and if the if you know this configuration was set because I flipped it on, then it hits the new code path, and if it's off, then it's just going to hit the Original code path, um, and all that is is just you know a separate um, a separate Zookeeper uh, node there that that has that config data, and so we have a pretty large you know you kind of as you as as we've gone we've like amassed more like configuration stuff and more feature flags and this kind of gets a little bit uh, out of control, but um, uh, so uh, yeah. I, I, we just use the hell out of it, um, and it, it's amazing. So. Do you eventually go back and like re <laughs> once you know it's yeah. stable, do you refactor like the flags back out eventually? Or? Yeah, yeah. That, but that's you know, there's there's no real process for that. But yeah, like just just today, I removed one that has been you know on for months, and I'm like, I hey, probably don't need this anymore. I think it's I think it's fine. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, that's on you to figure out. Um, so. The way you're writing your programs are to react to the configurations that you're using in Zookeeper. Mm -hmm. um, like what, can you give an example of what kind of uh, things you would be reacting to? Like you, you said before, um, like connections, you're getting a lot more traffic to your application. What kind of things would that change downstream? Um, so a lot of it, um, a lot of the stuff that's like uncertain, uh, or that's kind of like the environment is constantly shifting, is like uh, dumping logs into the database, and so the writes of logs and the reads, kind of balancing those. Um, you know, if one's too high, you can you can use all the resources, and you know, so if you have tons of writes, maybe that that's going to leave less resources for your reads. Um, and so one of the features uh, that we were fooling around with was. Um, Changes to like querying behavior. So, right now, like kind of the simplistic view is like you query the, the back end database for like give me a thousand logs that match this string. Um, and we were curious what would happen if we like split that up into five queries and then join them back. Um, and so, that's kind of a scary thing, you know, just to like quintuple is that what five is? Uh, your, your reads, you know, who knows what that's actually going to do. Um, and uh, so we so that was one of the things we hid behind a feature flag. Um, there's another project called Rollout, which is sort of a Ruby. Uh, we we made it Zookeeper backed, but it's just a way to like turn on a flag for a specific user or customer, um, or turn it on for a percentage of customers. Um, and so that was 
that's kind of one of the things we would that we've used that for and because you definitely don't want to just like explode your reads because you have no idea what's going to happen even if it's even if it's behind like a boolean flag on or off like you want to kind of have some fine control over okay let's crank up you know to 10 percent of our reads use this new method and see what happens and then let it run for a while and see what happens you know the highs and lows of the week if it's causing some problems then we can quick scale it way back um, so it's really all about like sort of mitigating unintended consequences at least that's kind of mostly what I've, how I've thought of it is, um, it makes a lot of sense. This may be a terrible idea. I mean, it has the potential to be terrible, but um, at least if you have some control over it, um, then it might only be terrible for a little bit and then you can quick turn it off. But that's also especially uh, goes, this assumes you have a, a lot of graphs and insight into your production system. Like if you're if you don't have any graphs to look at, like while you're flipping these things on and off, um, and, you know, then then who knows what what your system is doing. So, but that's content for another talk. Um, but yeah, so we'll we'll flip these things on and scale them up in like stair graphs for a day and make sure everything looks okay and uh, see what happens. Two questions: um, the distributed hash table. Uh, library you guys created. The unique path that you passed to each one, is that like the unique path that identifies it in Zookeeper? Yeah, something? yeah, yeah. Um, and the second question is, do you guys, is that like open source? Do you guys open source? Um, I think that is, I honestly don't know about that. Um, it's, uh, I think it was, I forget now. I'm trying to remember if I saw it in another project that was open source or if it was another one of our internal ones. Mm -hmm. um, it's not really all that, um, I'm sure there are other implementations of this, I guess, as much to say. This was just something that kind of grew uh, from what we were doing. Um, so I don't, I mean, it could be, probably. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a cool concept. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm sorry, you ran <laughs> um, So this is not more about how it changed your coding practices. It's more about the infrastructure of mm -hmm. the keeper. Is this an, uh, a completely in memory key yes. value store? Yes, Zookeeper wants to be in memory. If you're using too much, that you'll have bad times. Right, that's what it is. Um, so you, before you said, though, that any node could respond to a query. Yes. Does that mean that every node has, mm -hmm. there's, say, you have a five ring cluster, you have a copy of all yeah. the data in every single node? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So it's all, and so there's some like so new. It's not sharded at all. No, uh, -uh. it's all just a clone of it, um, and so that means, uh, and so it has some. It does some really cool stuff with uh, session tracking in that, um, because you know you have a couple nodes and you have several writes, so you can easily have um, you know while writes are being distributed, you could be disconnected from one and then reconnect to another one and you're not sure, like there's no guarantee that state is going to be consistent across all of them. Uh, so it does some cool stuff with um, session tracking in that uh, it's basically versioning, like saying, uh, you know, here's, here's as a client, like I want to, I got disconnected, I'm reconnecting and reestablishing like an interest in this um, node, Z node. So all the keys in, in Zookeeper are called Z nodes, I forgot to mention that. So. I'm just gonna start calling them Z nodes now. You can register an interest in that Z node and like pass and, and attach like a, a version. Like this was the last known state that I know, uh, and and so then you know that your view of the world it has a lot of like um, make sure that you don't see like your perception of the world like go back in time or um, or connect to a client or connect to a Zookeeper node that doesn't have the state that you last saw. Um, so yeah, there's there's definitely ways that it can that it can uh, get out of whack, but it, it does mitigate that for you substantially. So it's eventually consistent. Um, I don't know if it's eventually consistent to the definition, but um, sure, let's call it eventually consistent. Um, Isn't that implied that it's distributed? <laughs> or you get around that though with some backer clocking. Okay, backer. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, so I mean, the, the simple answer is yes. Like every node has the entire state of the world and it shares that among all the other ones. Um, so, you know, a loss of 
I mean, that also means that you know you can sustain the loss of one and still connect to the other one and know that right. that data is still going to be there. Uh, anything else? That's, that's all I got. All right, thanks.